Hello everyone, and welcome to the 8th Lorna Castleton Memorial Lecture. As last year, this year's lecture is taking place online to continue the Memorial Lecture Series, which was established in 2014 in memory of Professor Lorna Castleton, an honorary fellow of St. Cross College. Lorna was a renowned fungal geneticist and an enthusiastic supporter and promoter of science around the world in her role as the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society. So being able to have a global audience online today is particularly fitting. The college is very proud to be able to hold this annual lecture to honor Lorna's memory. We're delighted to welcome Professor George Church, who is co-initiator of the Human Genome Project to give this year's lecture on new technologies to enhance endangered species and ecosystems by diverse extinct DNA. George is the Robert Winthrop Professor of Genetics at Harvard Medical School, Professor of Health Sciences and Technology at Harvard and MIT, and a founding member of the Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. George was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2011 and to the National Academy of Engineering the following year. He's received a glittering array of awards and prizes over the years for his pioneering work on genomic science, as well as accolades for his science writing, including making the Scientific American Top 50 twice for designing artificial life and the $1,000 genome. In 2012, his co-authored book, Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves, was named the New Scientist Top Science Book. And to top it all off, George has also co-founded 38 biotech companies across his career. After George's lecture, there'll be time for questions and these can be typed into the Zoom Q&A box. George, we're very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I um, am delighted to, uh, to uh, be honoring a, a fungal geneticist. I, I, I am a part-time fungal geneticist uh, since I began my PhD thesis, um, but I won't be talking too much about that today. Uh, I will be talking about technologies to enhance endangered species ecosystems via diverse and even extinct DNA. Uh, it's aimed at a broad audience, but there will, I think there'll be a little bit of something for everyone, including some uh, occasional deep dives into the uh, science and technology. I, ha I have a conflict of interest in the lower right, uh, if you're interested in that. And, and I have thank yous spread throughout the the talk, including this slide, where I'm thanking some of the agencies that help get some of our um, wilder ideas out in, into the into societal benefit. Um, I, I will sprinkle through the talk uh, some of the considerations on on ethical, legal, social implications of of what we do, how we how we uh, approach that on all of our projects. But I'll give it in the context of one specific project. Um, uh, we take this quite seriously. Anyway, um, I think we're well past uh, criticizing the precautionary principle. I don't, I don't want to take any time on that. Uh, it, we're we're uh, in an era where it's not a great option to do nothing. Uh, either it's too late to do nothing or uh, various other reasons it's not physically possible. Anyway, um, we are at a, a point where Humans and our livestock constitute 96% of mammalian biomass worldwide. This is an amazing point. It, it, it used to be we constituted a, a, a single digit percentages and, uh, and less uh, uh, not too long ago. Uh, here's some, some of the books that, that talk about not, not only the fact that we're creating extinctions, but we're actually creating new species. Um, either intentionally or unintentionally via making hybrids and so forth. So it's not clear that the net change in species, what the net change is. Uh, I should also mention that 77% of our cropland is used for animals. Uh, this is um, well, domesticated ones, uh, as, as you can see. And I, I think that this is uh, not necessary, as we'll see uh, in, in the next couple of slides. We could fit in a thousand times smaller footprint, partly because we're already naturally aggregating in cities. Uh, we, we used to be less than 4% of our population was in cities, and now it's um, 
as as recently as uh, the late 1700s, and now we're 83 percent of the United States, and and similar numbers for other uh, industrialized nations, as indicated by the world at uh, at night. But the all, all, but by using this concentration of humanity um, plus increasing uh, efficiency of photovoltaics, um, we we can. Uh, we, we, we can consider alternatives where we are producing our, our food locally, um, maybe even in our homes, um, because the photovoltaics can either be remapped into uh, the light, the wavelengths that, that maximally stimulate photosynthesis, which are not green, they're uh, blue and, and red, uh, or, they can, or the, the photovoltaic uh, energy can be converted directly into chemicals without going through photosynthesis. And I've illustrated both of them here. Um, I, 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 here's a, a, a quote, uh, someone quoted me, uh, where uh, cholesterol energy, animal welfare pathogens is a pity to lose parts of our humanity and planet just due to lack of recipes. Um, so I think we're working on those recipes. Now, one way of increasing the uh, even more efficiency is um, increasing the rate at which biomass accumulates. And uh, for example, if we compare corn or other similar grains, uh, uh, they have a doubling time or their biomass will double in roughly 17,000 minutes. Uh, and the reason I do it in units of minutes is because these bacteria uh, both um, or, or microbes more generally, either photosynthetic or non-photosynthetic, depending on whether you're doing electrochemistry or photochemistry. I'll just, I'll just play this one again. You can see we, 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 our lab has championed a new, uh, a new winner for the doubling rate, which is now 14 minute doubling time compared to E. coli, which is one of the fastest laboratory uh, uh, species. Um, the, the, the Vibrio is, you can see, much faster, and they're both a thousand times faster than uh, typical grains. So just imagine that your, um, your corn, rice, or wheat field doubled in its uh, mass in uh, 14 minutes. So there's some opportunities there. And part of the reason, the, the other reason for optimism here is that our biotechnologies are improving exponentially. These are factors of 10 along the y-axis. They, um, uh, both for reading and writing DNA and, and all the sorts of things that you can do with biotechnology that involve reading and writing, um, analyzing our environment, analyzing um, uh, what's happening intentionally and unintentionally. So for example, the cost of of uh, reading a human genome has gone from $3 billion for a, a low quality, that is to say not clinically relevant, sort of half of a genome uh, to, for $3 billion to, two, to $300 uh, today for a high quality clinical grade diploid, meaning both the inheritance uh, uh, from your mother and your father. So every, uh, everyone, this is now getting in the range where it's affordable. It could be distributed free to everybody on the planet. Um, and, and we could uh, reduce medical costs in various ways. But that's not the topic today either. The topic here is, is how we're using our ability to manipulate single atoms uh, to allow us to leverage uh, and protect um, um, Ecosystems. So we're, a yachtogram is jargon for 10 to the minus 24 uh, grams. It, it means that it's um, a decimal point followed by 24 zeros. Um, and a yachtogram is essentially it's the, it's the mass of the smallest atom, which is a hydrogen. And so going from a, the, the, your genome is made up of four base pairs, as you may know, A, C, G, and T. And uh, if you change an A to a G via an intermediate, you're basically, the, that, that change, that deamination is changing a nitrogen to an oxygen, which is basically one atomic mass unit, one hydrogen equivalent. But that one little change um, is the, it opens the gateway to editing DNA 
and editing DNA opens the gateway towards um, um, solutions to a 1400 gigaton of carbon, let's say methane um, in the world. So, so that's 10 to the 18th uh, grams. Now we can edit by editing, we're using enzymes that will go in, find a particular location in the genome, which the, the scientist engineer has chosen and change as little as one base pair, that, that, uh, that, one, that one atom from a nitrogen to an oxygen, for example. And that gives us access to um, all parts of the genome, including parts that have been very difficult to study, both to read and to write, which is sometimes called dark matter. But we now have finally read uh, this for some genomes like the human genome, and we are now writing it, as I'll show you in a moment. And these are some of, we don't need to get into the weeds here, but these are a list of some of the common reasons that are either repetitive or of unknown function, uh, or hard to read or, or all of the above, okay? And they are, they're not, some of them are involved in senescence, neurogenesis, cancer, and inflammation, uh, but some of them are still quite uh, mysterious. So we took one of these mysterious ones just to show you how much editing we can do. Basically, that's the, the point of this digression into the dark matter is that we can do a lot of editing and we can do it in parts of the genome that just a few years ago, people thought were, was hard to read and write. So we are record now for the number of edits we can make, the number of changes in your, so the human genome and the elephant genome have about um, two copies of 3 billion base pairs. So 3 billion from mother and 3 million from the father, 3 billion. Um, and we can change uh, 2,400 of those um, um, quite accurately and completely. We can get all of the targets in this family uh, by changing A's to G's. Uh, at, for example, here's an A which, in black, which we change to a G in, in red. And this is uh, thanks to a variety of technologies that um, uh, this, this was done in human uh, pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that can turn into any cell in your body and they can even um, produce an entire organism. This mostly been done in mice, but these are human uh, pluripotent stem cells. And uh, this, I'll, I'll thank the people uh, from my lab that were involved in this, Corey, Oscar, Khalid, and Verena. And you'll see other people in other slides. Now, so now let's, uh, let's apply that powerful editing uh, methodology. I'm, I'm not gonna show you the, the enzymes and so forth, but trust me, they're there and the computers are all there. And it allows us to, to edit all kinds of uh, organisms, and all, they don't have to be model organisms and, it, and all kinds of base pairs and even the, the darkest parts of the genome are available now. And so here's part of the problem uh, or one of the problems we, we're choosing to look at is if you just fly over Siberia, you will find these big holes, which uh, seem to be uh, due to methane that's accumulating uh, both in the wet and the dry parts of the, um, and there's plenty of wetlands uh, throughout Siberia, at least in the summertime. And, and methane, I will remind you, is about 30 to 80 times worse than carbon dioxide for global warming. Uh, and there's a lot of it in Siberia. So, and, and here's a, um, a, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Sergei Zimov, showing that this methane is present in almost every frozen lake in Siberia by literally lighting the icy lake on fire. Um, so we approach this from the standpoint of an elephant. Uh, so it's somewhat humorous to say that there's an elephant in the room. Uh, there is the, the soil carbon is 1400 gigatons. And the reason there's so much of it, much more than there is in all the other rain, all the rainforests of the world put together, all the things, that in warm parts of the world. And the reason is, is each year for many, many millennia, uh, the, the seasonal um, surface is covered with the, the droppings of the, the excrement of animals, dust, uh, fallen trees and so forth. And then, and that gets frozen into the next layer of permafrost um, and then it keeps building up. And so there's 
hundreds of meters of topsoil throughout the Antarctic, um, while there's often as little as one meter in the tropical rainforest because it turns over so, so quickly. The, and to put this 1,400 gigatons in perspective, there are nine gigatons per year that we worry about the, for all human activity put together. So if all the humans left the planet, stopped polluting in every possible way they could, um, it would be a drop in the bucket compared to the 1,400 gigatons, which is already in a uh, feedback loop where methane is, and, and carbon dioxide are released that cause more warming, causes more uh, thawing of the permafrost and more release and so forth. So this is not something where we can just let it happen, probably. Not a good idea. Um, keystone species are key, are, are really a hard key uh, stone that they, uh, we don't have to micromanage every microbe and insect and so forth. If we can get leverage through something like the, the wolves in Yellowstone, which I'll mention later, and the elephants in the, in the Arctic. The elephants are unique among all the herbivores, all the animals in that they, uh, they like to knock down trees. And so what happened is when we eliminated all the herbivores, largely through human predation, um, possibly some climate involved, but uh, in any case, it changed the, the, the drastically changed the ecosystem from grass to trees, over 10 million square kilometers throughout the Arctic. And so if we convert a little of this back to, to grass, then we have a big impact on the albedo, the reflectance, uh, the grass is much more reflective than the trees, which are essentially black um, um, heat uh, conducting uh, poles. Um, photosynthetic rate of the grass is better and the grass allows the animals to penetrate and pack down the snow. So the minus 40 wind can, um, uh, can, can penetrate and cool down the summer uh, warm topsoil. And when I was in Siberia last was uh, the first time in recorded history that the summer topsoil thaw did not refreeze completely. Uh, and that's a, a milestone I wish we, uh, had not, I had not seen or had not happened. Um, it, this has been uh, heavily covered, even though we really didn't start seriously working on it until uh, 2021. Uh, there's been, we, we've been um, answering questions uh, and uh, provoking the, the conversation for, for a long time, since 2008. Uh, it's even been described as something that might, this, this was a paper that came out before current conflict with Russia, but uh, fall relationships with Russia. There are some, uh, so I've, I've, I know personally a number of elephants, and there's some of the places in the world where the elephants uh, are, grow, are, are kept uh, in, in, um, in the snow. Essentially, they have uh, access to the snow. And these are in Sweden, in, in um, Canada, and Switzerland, and they, they like it. They appear to like it, at least for short periods of time. They will break through the ice and swim in the, in the frozen lakes. They will build gigantic snowballs um, and so forth. They are in, endangered mainly by conflict with humans. The, the, they elephants tend to live in regions uh, where there's high human population density. And there's also a, a killer virus, uh, a herpes virus, that is killing off 25% of, of the the baby uh, calves. So um, they are good at, in, at, in, at knocking down trees. They love, uh, all, all elephants are endangered, but, and they, but all elephants are also uh, interested in knocking down trees. Whether or not there's anything at the top of the tree to bring down to an eating level, they, they will knock them down. Um, and uh, do it swiftly. I see it, for example, this tree doesn't have a whole lot to offer in terms of fruit and vegetation, but knock it down, they, they will. Um, you get the idea. Uh, and, and they're the only herbivore that does that. So we are uh, redesigning elephants uh, so that they will have access to the Arctic. Again, they're, they're at one point, elephant type species, including mammoths, mathas, and so forth, uh, occupied almost all the continents of the world not uh, Antarctica and Australia, but, uh, 
and we'd like to restore them to the Arctic, where especially to regions that had extremely low or zero human populations, um, but high carbon concentrations, the reasons that I talked about. So we're introducing new, new or old alleles, it does, we, we, uh, either one, to make them more well adapted to, to the cold and to other special challenges of our modern world, including resistance to, to viruses. Uh, so these new alleles or variations, in other words, variations in DNA include the, the, the size of the elephant, the blood, the fat, sensory components, the ear size. And we'll go through these um, one, and one, one by one here. So the size in tons varies from 0.3 tons, uh, so 300 kilograms for a, a, an elephant species that was in uh, extinct extinct but was in Crete um, to the largest is 22 tons um, uh, for a, uh, uh, for a, again an extinct uh, uh, specimen. Uh, most of the modern ones are about the size of the, uh, the mammoth that most people know. It's around in the uh, four to six ton maximum range. Uh, bison, which we'll mention, uh, is about one ton. Uh, there's extreme variation in tusk size, ranging from no tusks in both male and female in certain tribes, birds, uh, to these in absolutely enormous tusks uh, in one particular uh, tribe of uh, African elephants. And, and in many cases, the, the, gene, the genes involved, like here's a, a I'm not going to talk about too many gene names, but this one uh, is uh, AM. ELX is uh, involved, is one of the genes involved. Another set of genes that, that are involved in cold, now I'm gonna talk, focus a little bit more on cold rather than on size and tusk size. Uh, tusk size is important uh, because it, it, it might influence uh, poaching. And so we'd like to discourage poaching and we can do that uh, either by having uh, really good security or having no tusks um, or, or very small ones. Uh, here, there are two genes that have been brought back that have been, we, when we talk about de-extinction, we're talking about de-extinction of genes to bring back to enrich the diversity. So we're increasing diversity, not decreasing it. Um, there's a lot of decrease in diversity because we're, because modern humans are carving up uh, the landscape with roads, railroads, um, pipelines, but we can increase the diversity by introducing alleles from all over the world and all the way back as far as a million years in time. And so here's an example of one of those, which is a hemoglobin, a blood molecule that's part of the reason that your blood is red. Uh, and, uh, and this can be adapted for the cold because you know a good chunk of the, the, the surface area, the, uh, even the core temperature of the mammoth or the elephant is 34 degrees, um, the, the surface is, is close to the freezing point. Uh, hair is another adaptation to, um, uh, to, to the minus 40 degrees uh, that you get in the winter, as well as the, 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 the warmer temperatures in summer. Um, so the, the sparse uh, uh, stick-like uh, hairs of the African Asian elephant are good at radiating heat and um, the woolly uh, hair of the now extinct woolly mammoth and its relatives is very good at insulating. And we know a great deal about the, the genes uh, in elephants and especially in humans that are responsible for this extra hair. So for example, the, here's, here's uh, three humans that are, uh, that have hypertrichosis, uh, which is a, a, uh, a, an abundance of hair all over the body. Uh, so we know that we know that the, we can benefit from the deep knowledge of genetics and many of the technologies that have been developed um, for humans. Uh, external ear is another thing. They're, they're large to radiate heat uh, in the African elephant and they're uh, um, sm small in the mammoth. Uh, uh, to, to minimize the loss of heat. And then uh, 
an, another gene that's been brought back from, so, so we can read the genome of the ancient uh, mammoths. They've been very well preserved, frozen, almost in many cases, uh, we think nonstop since they died, um, somewhere between 4,000 years ago and, and a million years ago. And, and so we're looking at all these different uh, specimens from all over the world and, that, and all different times. And two genes have been fully brought back and tested, recreated and tested. So this is de-extinction of genes, not, not species. Um, and here's one that's involved in sensing uh, temperature and they're different genes. These are um, five different genes that have different temperature set points and, the, and, those, uh, and they vary in their strength uh, of function between the differ between elephants and mammoths. Now, uh, so I've, sh I've shown two here, uh, TRIPV3 and hemoglobin that we've already uh, brought back of 81 that's on our short list. Um, we're simultaneously developing tools so we can modify a lot more than 81 changes and, simul and also um, going through um, uh, listing all of the changes which are completely fixed, meaning that they're, they're two copies of, of almost all genes in your in, in human and elephant genomes. And if both copies in all of the mammoths that we looked at um, are of one type and both copies in all the modern elephants are of a different type, then that's a candidate for something that could be of, that was of selective advantage to the mammoth. Uh, very strongly so, it was completely fixed in the mammoth line and not in the elephant line, then, those that, then that, that's our longer list. So we're making that longer list, we're knocking through the short list, and we're improving the technologies. So I just will talk about how we're de-risking de uh, some of this uh, work already in, in other cases. Uh, I already mentioned that how we uh, de-risks sh shown proof of concept that we can do lots of edits. 24,000 edits, which is a lot more than the 81 edits in the previous slide, um, or 80, yeah, 81 local edits. Um, this is, uh, so I'm gonna show you what we're doing in terms of multiplex genome editing, as well as in vitro development of gametes and, uh, and embryos. This is especially challenging for mammals, uh, as you may know, uh, fish and amphibians, uh, reptiles, and birds develop outside of the body of the parents, the mother, um, um, but not, not for eutherian mammals. Um, so we've done uh, an example of something that we've done is we have um, changed 42 positions in the pig genome. We've done this because, uh, to deal with a transplantation crisis or we don't have enough uh, well-matched organs um, to, uh, to treat all, all of the diseases that, that cause uh, damaged organs. And this has been an idea that's been around at least since 1963. In 1963, 13 uh, kidneys were transplanted from uh, chimpanzees to humans. And one of them worked well enough that that teacher returned to uh, teach class for nine months. Uh, and um, and when the medical examiner uh, looked at what happened, the kidney showed no evidence of rejection. So that was one anecdotal positive 1963. Fast forward to today and the list of uh, uh, chimpanzees are not an option. One out of 13 uh, successes is not an option uh, for medical ethics reasons. So we need to get something where closer to 100% of the transplants um, persist for decades. And, and, that, and that has required um, at least 10, maybe as, 40, maybe as many as 40 changes in the genome. So this, these pigs, have, we've done pigs that, that have had as many as 42. Um, this has been reported in this series of papers down at the bottom, uh, peer reviewed. Um, they are now in, uh, these organs from pigs are now in preclinical and clinical trials in non-human primates and even in, in humans in four or five hospitals. Jim Martman, for example, is in charge 
of the surgeries uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital. And these 42 changes affect all kinds of different parts of the physiology, the sugars that coat the outside of the cells, the factors involved in blood clotting that are incompatible between human and, and pigs, um, the classic HLA antigens that are responsible for graft rejection. We obviously had to deal with those, uh, other immune functions. And we uh, significantly, the FDA was concerned about uh, the uh, approving organ transplant into immune suppress. All, essentially all organ recipients are immune suppressed um, by, the, by some miracle drugs that, allow, that, that really were a big breakthrough but they, they put the person at risk for infectious diseases, especially viruses that are produced by all the cells in the transplanted organs. So pigs' uh, organs produce these viruses and human cells will repro re reproduce them. And there was a recent uh, case where uh, a pig heart was transplanted to human. Uh, this was not from my lab, uh, but from uh, another one. And, uh, and, and, and it looks like a cytomegalovirus might have been involved. The ones that we eliminated viruses that are present in the genome of the pigs, these are present in, in uh, it's not a matter of hygiene, it's a matter of present in all. And we, we use these same editing methods that I've been talking about to eliminate all of the viruses uh, from multiple different strains of pigs. So we've done this over and over, works very robustly. You can eliminate all the viruses from the inherited. So the only viruses you now have to worry about are ones that are in the outside world, and that can be handled by um, good hygiene. Anyway, um, oh, I should mention that th thanks to uh, Luhan Yang, who was a graduate student and postdoctoral fellow in my lab, and she co-founded Genesis and Kihan uh, for the United States and China. And this is not just about dealing with a crisis of a lack of uh, high quality organs worldwide. It, we also would like to enhance these organs because we don't wanna transplant an organ and then have it fail um, for reasons that are avoidable. And we know in how in animals, either naturally or using uh, genetic engineering, there's peer reviewed literature on making, organis making um, animals like rodents resistant to multiple pathogens, to cancer, to senescence, uh, to immunities, some of which I've described in the previous slide, um, being able to preserve uh, in a frozen state and DNA damage. And here's some examples of two organisms that can survive at liquid helium temperature, uh, thaw, and then uh, reproduce. So, uh, so I, I say that these are, uh, that we know how to do this. I will show you in a moment how we can make them resistant to uh, multiple viruses, either one virus or all viruses. Um, and and I've, I've mentioned in the previous slide about immunity, and now I wanna talk just one slide about senescence. We're, we're interested in uh, aging, not just so that the organs will last a long time, so pigs senesce faster than humans. We don't want their organs to senesce quickly. So uh, we studied this in, in mice and dogs um, and soon humans, uh, where multiple genes can be introduced by gene therapy and can um, um, impact multiple diseases that are age-related. Almost all diseases have some age-related component, but these are some of the, the larger impacted, uh, larger impacts from aging seven different diseases we've worked, looked at so far, and some of these gene combinations will affect um, nearly all of them. And that's an indication that we're looking at the core aging components, not just some um, very disease-specific um, uh, trait, uh, some disease uh, uh, that's specific to the disease. Uh, Noah Davidson was involved in three of the four papers that, that our lab was involved in up here, all the ones involving AAV as the gene therapy vector, uh, just a, a jargon for what, uh, uh, for the way that we deliver the, the protein packaging. It's not, a, it's not a virus, it's just a protein packaging that allows us to deliver it to particular tissues. And Noah uh, was a postdoctoral fellow now, uh, started Rejuvenate Bio, which is aimed at both veterinary uses in pets 
and also uh, and now uh, soon in humans. Now that that I mentioned that viral packaging, uh, you can do viral and non-viral packaging, and they can either be used for rare diseases um, at millions of dollars per dose here, two point five million dollars per dose for for a, a, a breakthrough. Um, and very important impact on rare diseases like spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. Um, but as little as $2 a dose when they're aimed at something that's of a broad significance where the entire population is at risk, uh, like aging and, and, uh, and pandemics. So $2 a dose is the cost for the AstraZeneca uh, um, uh, vaccine. So this is either an AAV virus or adenovirus um, or uh, a non-viral particle. Now the virus that, that we're, the, if we had to pick one virus that we're particularly concerned of in elephants, it's EEHV. Uh, this is a herpes virus. It's a huge genome. These are all, all these little arrows are the, all the genes in it. Um, but we are, we are working on vaccines, on monoclonal antibodies and CRISPR-Cas9 as different ways of making them intrinsically immune uh, so that they carry around their immunity with them um, from birth. So we don't have to hunt down all the elephants in the wild to vaccinate them. They, these vaccines are auto vaccines that are produced within their body. And we're doing this in collaboration with uh, uh, Pauling and his lab. Now, the most radical way, and it's not by no means necessary for our initial goals, uh, it, the, but, this, but it shows how powerful the editing is, is that we can now, uh, we, we think we have now a general method we can make any uh, cell, any organism resistant to all viruses. And, um, and we have uh, demonstrated this, um, that, that we can make these cells um, use new chemistry for amino acids. We can be genetically and metabolically isolated, biocontained, and this multivirus resistant. A series of papers since 2009 from our lab and, and other labs, including some uh, people that came from our lab. Um, here's an example of that virus resistance uh, in an early strain, which is uh, not the most modern. The most modern one we have has not been published yet, but we think we have it resistant to all viruses. Um, here, uh, the zeros indicate it, the, the, um, the virus is going down from close to a trillion uh, viral particles per milliliter uh, of fluid down to zero. Um, not all viruses at, at this stage in the development were uh, uh, resistant, uh, were, the cells were not resistant to all viruses because some of the uh, viruses didn't use the, the codon that we changed. Um, but uh, anyway, this was, this was work from uh, Farron Isaacs, with whom we still collaborate. He was a postdoc in my lab. And also the Jason Chin's lab has worked on this as well. Uh, Akos and Anoush are in charge of the project right now. Uh, we have ways of testing um, uh, human tissues, and, and for that matter, any mammalian tissue that goes through stem cells into differentiated cells. Here's, for example, where we can make the cells that, that make your white matter and the your spinal uh, column conduct um, electrical signals quickly, more quickly than nor normal neurons. And these are removed in, um, in mice that have um, a genetic predisposition towards demyelination, losing this myelin sheath that's wrapping around the axon and the neurons. And we can re restore this by, by uh, surgically implanting these engineered um, um, tissues that we made from stem cells. We want to harvest, harness that same kind of technology where we can skip over um, developmental steps or recapitulate developmental steps entirely in vitro. So these, these human um, brain components were grown outside of my brain. These are actually cells that, that I donated from my, my skin. Uh, they tur we turn them into stem cells and then into um, uh, various brain cells, neurons, and oligodendrocytes. This is work of Alex and Peristu, who have now gone on to, to start a company called GC Therapeutics uh, to, to um, get this through clinical trials and into, and into patients, showing that it worked, already shown that it works in animals. So we're doing similar things now 
for uh, other stages of development, in fact, all stages of development, we have um, pro protocols that allow us to make sperm and egg from these skin derived uh, stem cells. And uh, we can in do in vitro fertilization. And this, is, this whole process has been done in mice many times um, where you can develop sperm and egg in vitro outside the body, fertilize outside the body and, and um, get development at least part way through, um, sort of 55% uh, of the way through gestation. At the other end, so that's at the beginning of gestation from in vitro fertilization. At the other end, there's a, a growing ability to do, uh, deal with premature births in mammals. So human preemies are actually ahead uh, in this. Uh, we can cover about 47% of the pregnancy gestation. Uh, and there's, and here's an example of a lamb growing through the stages where it goes from no hair, hairless to, to woolly, um, all, all being done in a, in a bag rather than inside of the, the mother. Um, and this is um, work from the flake lab. And I just kind of wrapping up here on what, we're, what, we're, what we want to do with uh, these elephants that will be adapted to the Arctic. Um, we want them to be highly socialized. Um, they, the elephants um, do learn from their elders, um, but there are plenty of examples where, where we've been forced, the, the good guys have been forced to deal with uh, elephants that have been either abandoned or more often orphaned by poachers. Um, and and so, so technology has been developed for uh, feeding, caring for, and, and teaching behavioral um, traits to, to these orphaned uh, uh, elephants. Again, the African and Asian elephants are uh, endangered. This is uh, a, a topic of rewilding. We, we want to essentially rewild these elephants to an environment they haven't been in, in or their relatives haven't been in for a long time, uh, thousands of years, say, in the Arctic. Um, and rewilding has some precedence here. Uh, it is um, usable. It, it has been used in uh, restoring wolves after 70 years being missing from Yellowstone National Park in the United States. They were, the studies were done and it was uh, decided that it would probably be, be safe and advantageous to restore the wolves. And they were restored around 1994, 95. Uh, and here's some, some data uh, documenting how once they were restored, they um, kept in check a lot of the herbivores, kept the herbivore uh, uh, numbers reasonable. Um, and, and then there was rest restoration of many of the, the trees, like the willows, and then that caused an increase in beavers, which caused an increase in lakes, ponds. And so, uh, so you can see how one keystone species, the wolf, can have ramifications throughout the ecosystem. So if you, if you study it well enough, um, you, can get, you can leverage uh, in, with this uh, broad strokes. Um, another example of a keystone species is the bison. That went from about uh, 500 um, or, or low hundreds uh, in, in, um, it was almost completely extinct to now half a million today. And, um, and, and back, back to the business of, be, of teaching behavior, um, there are, the California condor was required uh, actually um, uh, creativity in terms of hand puppets to, a, to, a, to allow a quadrupling of the number of offspring that could be rescued per year that could be uh, uh, grown uh, in the lab. And now they've uh, restored them to the wild. And there's over a thousand species that have been introduced across North America for the last 125 years, mostly successfully. Um, and this is true in Europe and Asia as well. Um, so we're focusing, we will be, if we can um, do for the elephants that we did for pigs, which is do multiple edits and get the, them to, um, to grow in the laboratory so we can have 
dozens, hundreds, tens of thousands of uh, uh, elephants have been engineered to be resistant to pathogens and um, resistant to cold. And then we will focus the, the reinstall, the rewilding these into regions of the Arctic, Canada, Alaska, and Russia that have very high carbon that we want to protect. We want to keep the methane from going into the air and causing global warming. And so high carbon and low human population density. And so that's what these, some of these yellow and orange are, where uh, the little cutout circles, you might be able to see these are regions where the, a human population density, and we're trying to avoid uh, those regions, unless we're specifically invited by unanimous approval, uh, we're trying to avoid by about 100 kilometer radius. Um, there is a reason to believe that, that you can guide uh, elephants uh, around. Uh, they, they travel uh, tremendous distances in a, a typical lifetime. They'll go the equivalent of, of two and a half times around the, the planet. Uh, typically, it'll be more of a random walk in a local area. Um, they can smell up to 19 kilometers away, and they're highly attracted to forbs, which is a scientific term for uh, flowering, um, certain species of flowering plants that they love. Here's an example of them invading a farmland, uh, and this is the reason there's a conflict. And I just want to uh, op open up for questions just a second. I, I, I want to, uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, so hopefully you have a lot of questions queued up. Um, I'd just like to thank, I've been thanking people along the way, but these are some that are specifically involved in this um, elephant project over the, over the many years. Uh, during the dry years where we didn't have any funding, uh, we were living on about uh, $10,000 a year for the entire project, thanks to uh, uh, Peter Thiel. Um, Revive and Restore is uh, applying modern molecular biology, both reading and writing to um, rescuing endangered species. And that is the primary goal of our project as well as rescue the, and re revive and restore the elephants and the Arctic ecosystem. And Ryan Phelan and, and Stuart Brand uh, and I uh, started thinking about this uh, in, the, in around 2006. Sergey and Nikita Zimov. Sergey has been writing about uh, this problem of the 1400 gigatons of carbon trapped in the Arctic that's getting thawed. He's been a visionary at least since the 1980s. And then here's some of the members of our team at, at Harvard over the years. Uh, Ariona has, uh, has joined uh, with Ben Lamb, uh, found funding for us uh, for uh, a team uh, that will be both academic and uh, corporate, called, corporate called Colossal. Uh, Jessica, Justin, Margot, Bobby, and others have, uh, have helped uh, in the academic research. So period, full stop. I'm gonna stop sharing and open it up for questions. Thank you. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. I'm gonna um, uh, read them. Um, so uh, 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 the first one uh, is about uh, do introducing alleles into uh, interfere with ethical concerns. What are the, so I, I mentioned some of the ethical concerns. Uh, in particular, I think there are ethical concerns that elephants are going extinct. Um, so we would like to be able to change that. Uh, now, if we introduce them into the Arctic, we will change the, the we could change the ecosystem. In fact, that's the intention. Uh, to restore it to, to an ecosystem that had greater ecological diversity and, um, and, and, a, and a healthier place for the elephants um, out of human conflict. Uh, I, you know, probably other questions will come up where we can uh, uh, discuss other aspects of this. This is a very big question I'm sure will come up. So second uh, question is uh, from Simon, do tusks help felt fell trees? Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, for the tuskless elephants have no trouble uh, knocking down the trees. Uh, and they, they, they seem to do, they seem to thrive uh, fine in, in every regard. Uh, but there are known uh, uses, both uh, 
possibly in, in, in um, um, reproductive displays, um, uh, male, male, uh, and, uh, and others, um, as well as digging up roots and, and things like that. Um, the, the third question is, uh, have we re removed uh, endogenous retrovirus from pigs? And if so, what are the consequences of this for the normal physiological function of the animals? Great question, uh, Liz. This is, um, uh, if we had removed the complete retrovirus from the, the genome, it, it, it probably would have had big consequences. As it is, there doesn't seem to be any consequences. These animals um, reproduce um, normally, they're healthy. In fact, they're healthy enough to be donating organs um, for these preclinical and clinical trials. Um, the reason I say that it would have been a big deal if we had deleted the whole thing was uh, that there's a, a piece, uh, the, the, red, the part that we uh, mutated was the parts that's responsible for the virus jumping around um, and, and produ producing virus that can uh, infect other cells like the human cells and the organ recipients. The part we left uh, intact is called the envelope gene. It's the, it's the outside of the virus. Um, and that is involved is in many mammals. Um, we don't know all of them, but in some mammals, it, it contributes to the extra embryonic membranes in the developing fetus. Um, and um, it also is responsible for rejecting super infection by uh, related viruses. So, so it has two functions, both of which uh, we think were important in, in our experiments. Uh, let's see. Uh, as a uh, Ann Harris says, as a molecular geneticist, I sometimes get asked to recreate a much loved disease domestic pet from DNA, not from living cells. Um, how, would, how would I answer that question? Um, so uh, the, there are companies that will do cloning of domestic pets, but you do have to have uh, uh, some tissue. Um, it can be frozen if it's properly frozen. There's I think the, the longest that a frozen tissue has been cloned is 20 years or 25 years, certainly not the thousands of years that, that because over thousands of years that the mammoths have been frozen, they've been irradiated uh, and their DNA has been broken into a million pieces. But, uh, but a, a, a pet that, that some body part has been frozen would work. But if you just have DNA, I think that's very challenging. And, in, and indeed, even cloning uh, doesn't really restore the pet that you knew. It restore, it's like another um, member of a breed. So unless you have an outbred pet, meaning you know, not, not a typical inbred, most uh, many, not all, but many dogs and cats, for example, are inbred, uh, you, you're gonna do as well or better by getting a, another member of that breed. Um, I think eventually this is possible. Um, it may be possible to make a genetically identical, but it would be right now it would be prohibitive um, it, uh, from a cost standpoint, and it would take a long time. But but these are exponentials, and and uh, many things that that took decades uh, and billions of dollars, for example, sequencing human genome, are now days and hundreds of dollars. Okay. Um, Wow, a lot of questions, but uh, how many modified elephants do you think it would take be required in, in Pleistocene Park to have significant effects? Well, Pleistocene Park is currently 16 kilometers, square kilometers, and it's estimated that the Arctic elephants, the mammoths, uh, were about one per kilometer. So that would be about 16 in Pleistocene Park, um, but we want to restore this to all of those orange regions that are high in carbon and low in pop, human population. And we think that that's in the tens of thousands of, of elephants, which we think could be produced in a very short period of time if the, the new reproductive technologies can be in, 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 and behavioral technologies can be employed. Uh, good question, thank you. Um, 
Nathan's question is, would the insertion of alleles into species to resist pathogens um, uh, include fetal resistance to the pathogen? Uh, the, uh, it would, by, by uh, <clears throat> as they breed, so as we transition from sort of uh, breeding outside of the body to breeding inside the, but outside the body, it's in a sterile environment. So, so there's no pathogens. Inside the body, the mother is resistant and then provides a great deal of uh, protection. Um, but yes, the, the, to, to, the, to the question, we can also make them resistant in a way that's independent of the mother. Um, and so I, I mentioned three ways. Um, so a, a auto vaccine, a um, uh, the, the, um, uh, and monoclonal antibodies of neutralizing, um, and uh, and so on. The, the the auto vaccine only works once it develops the immune system. So it depends on the maternal antibodies uh, prior to weaning. Um, but the but the CRISPR. And the uh, monoclonal antibodies could work from, from as soon as the fetus is uh, uh, has enough cells to make those. Uh, so Barry Warner asked, "What virus ca caused the heart transplant to fail between a pig and a human?" Uh, I, I mentioned very briefly in passing, but it was cytomegalovirus or CMV. This is a, a virus that's uh, very prominent uh, in, in most mammals. Uh, and uh, it, with immune suppressed patient, it's a, which is typical for all kinds of transplants, even uh, human to human, uh, it's a particularly bad case. So this is something that probably should have, that, that all transplants are supposed to be checked for all pathogens. Uh, I think, um, I don't know exactly, there's still a, an, is an ongoing investigation as to how that slipped through the cracks in this case. Like I said, my, my, my team was not, my academic and corporate teams were not involved, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was cytomegalovirus, but it is said to be cytomegalovirus. Uh, uh, what, there's a question about uh, pain management. Uh, how do we know uh, what's going on in pain? So uh, mo most animals, uh, you, can, you can tell by a variety of physiological measurements whether they're in pain or not. Uh, there's even the opportunity for uh, having the animals have less pain than normal. So for example, uh, uh, there, there are mutations in humans that, that make us uh, uh, resistant to pain. Uh, so some humans walking around uh, have a double mutant in uh, SCNA9, uh, which is a pain receptor. Um, and, and, and so they, they're so impervious to pain that they will intentionally poke themselves for abusing their friends. Uh, and they often die because they, they chew on body parts and get infected. Um, you could also uh, reduce pain and increase pleasure by uh, harnessing the endogenous um, uh, uh, op opiate pathways, uh, and, and these in, uh, in the uh, animal. Um, let's see. Um, what role can gene synthesis as opposed to gene editing play in addressing, um, what, what we've been talking about? This is from Andrew Briggs. It, it is, uh, in, in a sense, all gene editing involves some gene synthesis. You have to synthesize the editor, uh, the editing components. Um, but the, the, the question here is, we were getting better and better at synthesizing genomes. And in fact, uh, the method that I briefly described of uh, where we can make uh, a microbial, uh, industrial microbe resistant to all viruses in, uh, involves synthesis of the entire genome. Um, in that particular case, editing, if we tried to edit that many sites, so somewhere between 20,000 and 60,000 sites, uh, it would have been cheaper just to synthesize all things. So that's what we did. But for, for a lot of the things we're doing in um, human pigs and, and elephants, uh, it's, it may be uh, more cost effective to edit. So this is ongoing research to find out. Um, 
do I, uh, uh, this is a, from Scarsbrook, uh, do I see shifts in the public perception concerning the, the finality of extinction as a risk associated with species revival? I think that, I think the public, it, or at least the interested public is, is, I think, getting pretty clear that it is still difficult and expensive to reverse extinction or to in, increase diversity using extinct alleles, I think is a more realistic version of this. Um, but I think it does change the conversation to um, conservation of species being uh, a battle uh, or a war that we will ultimately lose. And it's just a matter of delaying it as much as possible to something where we can um, uh, reverse um, losses. Uh, we can increase diversity beyond our current diversity, um, possibly even more diverse than, than has ever occurred in a particular species. So I think that that's a very interesting change in the conversation uh, that is happening. Certainly in conservation groups are getting more clued in to the molecular opportunities. Um, increasingly, they're monitoring all the species of the world and all the variations in those species using the, the new sequencing methods that my group and others have developed. Um, I think there's growing in, uh, knowledge and enthusiasm for monitoring and, and altering. Um, Jennifer Loros asks about circadian biology related genes uh, among, she, she noticed in, in the list uh, that I showed, um, What's the connection to mammoth biology? So some of the genes that will be changing, we don't know uh, all the details of how it works. We just know that it was highly enriched, essentially completely to the exclusion of previous alleles uh, in the mammoth lineage. So it was a mammoth split off in the family tree um, and, and, and excluded in the opposite direction for modern elephants. Uh, in the case of circadian biology, there is some um, indication that these are also involved in hibernation. And, and, and hibernation, of course, has a wide range of, of degrees and mechanisms and, and, uh, and you know, how much that hibernates. And so, but there is some evidence that, that um, mammoths may have had, uh, may have used some of those physiological mechanisms um, um, during the uh, and some of those may have involved circadians, but I'm speculating. I think that falls in the category where we don't really know. Um, is it likely for an elephant that already lived half its lifetime in temperate regions to live its remaining lifetime in the tropics? Uh, this is from uh, Adam Mariah. Uh, so, there, there is a fair amount of moving around of elephants for breeding purposes, for acquisition by um, uh, elephant rescue teams, uh, for you know wild um, um, uh, conservation lands. Uh, and I mentioned that some elephants have moved have been moved to, uh, to even snowy regions. Uh, they are quite adaptable. They have, they have to be adaptable over short periods of time because of the fluctuation from summer to, to uh, winter. Um, and the mammoths, for example, had to tolerate ranges from 20 degrees uh, in the, uh, Celsius in the summer to minus 40 in the winter. Um, I don't know what the limit to that is. Uh, Kiana... Uyang uh, asks, the modification process in the elephant requires lots of edits. How would you ensure these edits are functionally effective? Uh, and what are the ethics? So uh, I, I've mentioned, I mentioned two functional, two genes that we've already tested functionally um, that happen to be easy to test at sort of the biochemical and cellular level, which is the, the blood hemoglobin and the nerve uh, trip V3 genes. Um, they will be uh, tested functionally uh, in embryos, in fetuses, in newborns, um, very cautiously starting um, with, with one or two 
um, at a time um, and then scaling up uh, if they if it looks like they're providing uh, functional advantage. So for example, if, if they provide resistance to uh, viruses, we can establish that at a cellular level and then confirm it in uh, newborns and calves that normally we get the virus on weaning. Um, so uh, Andrea Nicorara uh, asks, uh, what other keystone species would you like to see de-extincted and what uh, would have a lot of impact? Now we've, uh, so at Revive and Restore, there's a large community uh, uh, interested in this sort of uh, thing. And they have a list of, you know, hundreds of species that people advocate for various reasons, um, uh, most both endangered and extinct. Uh, I, I think uh, so, some other ones that, that are uh, popular that we pro probably will uh, take under consideration. We're trying to develop technologies that anybody can use, uh, but we, we may help with the thylacine, which was a marsupial uh, carnivore, and the, um, and the dodo, which is a, a flightless bird. Uh, but, um, but I would ur urge you to look at the Revive and Restore website for additional species like the, the stellar sea cow, uh, manatee relative, which was enormous, um, and, 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 and what whales that are, that are endangered and so on. So I think we need to uh, wrap it up at this point. Uh, I hope that I have enjoyed the uh, Q&A. Uh, section. Um, we have one last question, uh, and, and then uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody uh, that participated. Uh, this question is, how important do we see biobanks for the further resolving and understanding genetics? Um, the, the UK biobank is amazing. Uh, they're, they're doing a great service uh, for not just the United Kingdom, but the whole world. Um, I, I, I was on, in a meeting with them um, just a couple of days ago, and, and they they mentioned that they're contributing 500,000 human genomes and related traits. That's important. You don't, not just genomes, but the the medical uh, data as well. Uh, so that's a tremendous gift. But the biobanks, specifically for understanding mammalian genetics more broadly, um, is important. Uh, in, in in their frozen zoos, like the San Diego frozen zoo, but their frozen zoos all over the world. And for for uh, both uh, plants uh, for animals and equivalent ones for plants that I think could be quite uh, quite valuable and I've already uh, two uh, frozen species uh, examples of species that are endangered have been brought back recently the Przewalski's uh, horse um, and uh, black-footed ferret so I'll uh, wrap it up there thank you thank you all for all your uh, very enthusiastic questions. Professor Church, thank you so much. Um, one of the great pleasures from my point of view as uh, Master of St. Cross is enjoying these extraordinary talks which are arranged for us under a number of headings. Lorna Castleton, I'm sure, would have been absolutely fascinated by that. And one of the things for me as a, as a non-geneticist, non-scientist, is the, the range of partnerships that you've created in order to work from the very highest cutting edge science through to the conservation science and the reintroduction potentially um, in times to come. And that was the one question I might have asked you, which is what your time horizon is for having um, these modified elephants able to survive in Arctic circumstances. So maybe I can sneak that one in. What would you say was the answer to that? Uh, you bet, I'm happy to. That's, that's a favorite question among journalists. Uh, it, it, Sorry. <laughs> and scientists, <laughs> but uh, the um, the CEO of Colossal, uh, who doesn't speak for the entire team, but uh, but uh, his personal goal is six years for the first engineered calf. Like I said, we've already engineered a few generations of pigs, um, so but the first elephant calf, six years, that includes two, 22 months, almost two years of gestation just for the pregnancy alone, um, probably a couple of years to, to work out the, the, the technology and then another two years for just uh, re repeating and uh, making, making sure that it's working well. And then after that uh, first one is born, 
then we can very quickly scale up to thousands simultaneously. Um, and it, and there's uh, um, uh, reproductive age. We, we don't depend on them reproducing in the wild for, for a lot of our climate mitigation uh, strategies, but reproductive age can be as young as eight years. Um, typically, it's a bit older than that. Um, and they can start migrating uh, around that age as well. Um, yeah. Talking about something that's definitely viable within current lifetimes to potentially see these that, elephants. Unless so, yeah, unless we out. Yeah, that I, I I I hope we can we can all live to see it. Yes. That's extraordinary. Because the the other thing that I thought was really interesting, you you referenced the wolves in in Yellowstone, and um, one of the other uh, things that I I believe is true that that the rate of change and restoration in Yellowstone once the wolves were, in, were reintroduced was much, much faster um, than had been predicted by conservationists before they were reintroduced. So um, if, if we were being optimists, we might hope that maybe the reintroduction of these or introduction of these elephants into the Arctic might have quite a pace of impact. Right. We might be able well to see the impact quite quickly. Yeah, especially since we're not going to be doing this randomly, uh, we're going to be introducing them specifically into regions that have high carbon and low human population. And so they, if they could, there's, there's always seen, there's already seen an impact in Pleistocene Park without the elephants, uh, just of herbiv herbivores plus some um, clearing of trees manually. Um, so yes, I think you're, I think you're right. I think that it might go. Uh, more quickly than than most people would expect. Thank you. I think what has been so wonderful about your talk this evening is that so often when we think about um, the impact of, of climate change and and uh, the the dreadful uh, impact that it's having on on our natural earth, it, it's in a tone of of um, some despair. And what you've talked about are really cutting edge but happening now techniques to give hope for at least slowing the process to give us more time to work on the other technologies which will enable us to hopefully reverse and actually get into project drawdown type territory where we're reversing the uh, the impact so i i can't think of a better way of starting a weekend than a friday evening that gives us a huge insight into scientific and technological advance and also hope for the future that comes with it so on behalf of all of us that have enjoyed your talk and the answers to questions this afternoon i'd just like to say thank you so much for being with us and i know that um, a lot of people who've been on the call this evening will be talking about all the things you talked about with their friends and acquaintances for a long time to come. And I hope going and looking at Restore and Revive and see what the options are for the future as well. So thank you very much indeed, Professor. Thank Church. you. Yeah, take care.